Olá, a IUPAP, International Union for Pure and Applied Physics, está interessada em muitas coisas. Dentre elas, a definição das unidades básicas que nós usamos no dia a dia, a manutenção das constantes fundamentais, mas também está muito interessada nos desafios que a ciência tem atualmente. Na área da física são muitos os desafios. Nós temos desafios desde o entendimento das partículas elementares, da matéria condensada, na física nuclear, é, na biofísica, na astrofísica. Em todas as áreas, ou sub-áreas da física, nós temos desafios. Para que você saiba quais são esses desafios, a IUPAP organizou um workshop especial que chama-se Entendendo os Desafios da Física Moderna. Cada área da física está aqui é, sendo apresentada por um líder, membro da IUPAP, e que você terá então agora a chance de entender, através desta apresentação, os desafios que a área apresenta e como os físicos, de um modo geral, estão superando esses desafios para que a física seja um instrumento de entendimento das ciências naturais e que auxilie o homem não apenas a avançar o seu conhecimento, mas a tornar a ciência um instrumento útil da melhoria de vida de cada um existente nesse planeta e nesse universo. Assista e também faça parte do entendimento dos desafios da física moderna. Boa sorte! Okay, so first I want to thank the organizers to uh, allow me to speak to you here and uh, expose what we do uh, in this and what our uh, perspectives are uh, to such a large audience and uh, different communities. <coughs> so um, <coughs> uh, uh, I will speak about uh, experiments, mainly what we, uh, we do in, uh, in this on light scattering on cold atoms. And, and at the end of the talk, I will uh, tell you how we go from this cold atom uh, physics to astrophysics uh, and show you recent results on this. <coughs> so the outlook, outline of this talk will be, uh, uh, for the light scattering part, we'll have two components. Uh, our main focus actually is to look at Anders localization, which we heard the other day already, uh, by non-interacting waves. So our non-interacting waves are, are photons, are light, electromagnetic waves. And uh, uh, this uh, quest brought us actually to study something else, which I will ex explain to you, which is thicker subradiance. Uh, and uh, I will explain you how we think that these two uh, ways of uh, having interferences with electromagnetic waves uh, can affect and can be studied in cold atoms. And then I will uh, explain you a little bit what we did about intensity correlations in cold and hot atomic samples, and how we exploited this expertise to go to astrophysics. And if I have some time, uh, not sure, I will uh, tell you a little bit how uh, we will use uh, cold atom uh, features not only to uh, look at the light scattering, but also how to we can, we can we control and modify the atomic motion in uh, cold atoms and maybe even beyond. Okay, so uh, this is actually uh, an overview of uh, my talk, and this is basically also the summary of what I want to tell you. Uh, the idea is uh, we want to uh, see what happens if you have uh, large samples, so it's a many-body problem uh, of uh, scatterers, uh, atoms, or whatever other scatterers you can have, and there are different ways uh, how to, uh, uh, to describe the propagation of the, in this multiple scattering uh, medium, uh, and there are different ways actually to uh, keep a photon inside a system for a long time. So it's about storage of a photon in a large sample. Uh, so one way how to store a photon in large sample is uh, uh, just a random walk of particles without interference effect. This is what I would call radiation trapping or multi incoherent multiple scattering. And this is uh, what can be uh, used to describe a random walk by diffusion equation of uh, light in, in the cloud in fog, for in fog, for instance. But then there are two other uh, ways how to keep a photon in a sample for a very long time, which are based on inter interferences. And one uh, way is uh, what I will explain to you is under localization. And the other is thicker subradiance. 
And to give you a flavor of what's happening is, consider that we are all cold atoms here in the cloud, and I want to keep one photon for a long time in this, uh, in this sample. So one, one uh, possibility is that the photon starts and jumps from one atom to the other, just incoherently, and at some point it will reach the border and escape. So the larger the sample, the longer it takes to escape. Uh, Anders localization is a different feature. It's something where a few atoms, let's say this bunch of cold atoms here, they will share the excitation, and the rest of the system will not know that there's one excitation stored in a sub-unit uh, of this uh, whole cloud. And Dicke subradiance is in yet another way how to do this, and that's a situation where all the atoms here, the whole room knows that there's a photon, and we just in, uh, are somehow synchronized, and we uh, oscillate out of phase, and we keep the photon together in the cloud, but everyone knows that there's a photon in the cloud. So there are different ways how to store a photon for a long time in a system, and we will use cold atoms to, uh, to study these different features. Okay, so uh, first, <coughs> the first idea about uh, wave propagation disordered medium is that if you uh, forget about interferences and if you think that if you have a disordered medium and you have a configuration average, all interference effects will be washed out, and then you think that you can use a diffusion equation uh, which describes the spread of the excitation uh, uh, as a function of time, and uh, the important parameters here are the mean free path, so how far does a, a photon propagate before it changes direction, that this mean free path, and then it has a time constant associated to these uh, independent steps. But Anderson showed in 58 that uh, if you take into account interference effect, uh, a very uh, surprising effect can appear, uh, and if the disorder is strong enough, then uh, this diffusion coefficient at some point will, uh, will go to zero, and this excitation will not spread any longer and will be localized. That's what we call Anders localization, and this has been uh, studied primarily for uh, condensed matter systems, but uh, as I will show you, we study now other systems to have a more pure version uh, to, to study the purely disordered induced uh, absence of diffusion. One thing I want to point out here is that there's no microscopic theory to describe this. So that's an important point. So uh, despite uh, this uh, 50 years old uh, topic, uh, there are some approaches on theory which is called self-consistent theory of localization, uh, or there's a scaling theory, gang of four, and, uh, but all these are uh, based on approximations, and I will show you some examples where these approximations fail. And uh, then there are numerical studies, which show you a little bit more what can happen, but for this you need a toy model, or you need like, a simulator in Hamiltonian to see what type of system to, to simulate. And I will come back to, to this uh, important issue, uh, and, uh, which gave us some surprises recently. Okay, so uh, as I said, that <coughs> under localization was primarily uh, studied for uh, electrons to study the uh, insulator conductor transition, uh, but electrons have very strong interactions, uh, so the idea is to find some ways which have no interactions to study the pure disorder interference induced uh, uh, localization. So there have been a couple of experiments in the recent years in acoustics where there was a network of uh, aluminum beads where they saw under localization. Meta waves have been studied. Uh, one was uh, in the dynamic localization regime, the technique which has been pioneered by our previous speaker and which has been brought to three dimension uh, more recently in, in Lille. And then there has been experiments on meta waves in these other potentials uh, where uh, under localization of meta waves have been studied. My interest is of electromagnetic wave or photons in the optical regime. And uh, what we need there is very strongly scattering uh, samples. And people have studied semiconductor powders or white paint to study this. And what we use is cold atoms here, like uh, uh, the one pioneered by Bill Phillips and this type of samples, to, uh, to exploit the strong scattering properties of these cold atoms to look for uh, the possibility to get under localization. Okay, so what is important for uh, under localization, uh, which is called mesoscop mesoscopic physics, we want to see when interferences can uh, change the diffusion properties. And there are different scales which are important. One really important parameter is the mean free pass. The question is, how far does the photon go before it changes direction? That's the mean free pass. If this mean free pass is very large, uh, and uh, larger than the coherence length, this means that the phase information of this photon is lost when it changes direction. And in this case here, we can use a diffusion equation to describe the physics. If the uh, coherence length is very long, so if you don't have decoherence, then uh, we get something which is called weak localization, which is a precursor of under localization, which has been studied in many, many different systems. I will show you what we did, but this is well, well understood. And the idea is that if the mean free pass is becoming of the order of the wavelength, so if the photon changes direction at the scale of the wavelength, so very strongly scattering systems, then we expect strong localization. And uh, so this is uh, the, like the holy grail of this community to understand the purely disordered uh, uh, induced uh, uh, absence of diffusion. 
So <coughs> another way to see this is that if you have photons which jump around from one atom to another, one particle to another, you have a random walk we described by diffusion coefficient here. And this mean free pass depends on the uh, uh, scales like 1 over the density of the particles times the scattering cross-section, which is something we can easily change with cold atoms. And if you take into account the interference correction, there's a, a change to this diffusion coefficient, which goes like 1 over this k times L squared parameter. k is the wave number, 2 pi over lambda, times this mean free pass. So if the mean free pass is very large compared to the wavelengths, this is a small correction. So the diffusion is a little bit reduced, but it's only a small correction. But if KL is of the order of one, then you expect this to go to zero, and that's why we expect strong localization. So that's the, like the state of the art in the last uh, years. That's where we expect strong localization of, of light. Okay, so uh, what about weak localization? The first thing, so one way to look at uh, weak localization for light is to look at current backscattering. So I come in with a plane wave, with laser beam, I go on a random medium, and I will scatter here photons on different atoms, different paths, and pass one and pass two, they touch different scatterers. So if I change the configuration of, the of these scatterers, the phase between pass one and pass two is random, and there will be no uh, average effect which will survive. But <coughs> uh, if I... Uh, consider a more precise description of this, there's also the possibility that the, this uh, photon here first hits the last scatter here and then does the reverse pass inside the sample. So this direct and reverse pass are strongly correlated, so they have to take into account very precisely the interference between the direct and the reciprocal pass. And I can compute the phase difference between these two uh, pairwise passes. And what I see is that this phase difference here depends still on the position on the first and the last scatterer. Inside of the sample, everything is automatically compensated by construction. There's only a geometrical phase factor here, but if I look in the backward direction, so if k in plus k out is zero, so exactly in backward direction, then this phase difference is zero, whatever uh, configuration I have in the sample. Uh, so in that case, in this backward direction, I have to add up the fields pairwise instead of the intensities, and this gives me an enhanced effect of a factor of two of the average intensity in backward direction. So for people liking optics, this is like a Sanyak interferometer here, where I got the constructive interference, but I have billions of Sanyak interferometers which are automatically aligned. I no, don't need to touch any mirror. I get a, a, a big bunch of interferometers which are automatically aligned in the backward direction. So this is an effect which is uh, well known since uh, more than 30 years. Uh, so here's an example uh, of a piece of Teflon. So I, if I come with a laser beam on a piece of Teflon or anything white uh, board here, I see speckle, uh, speckle pattern. And this is a cut along one uh, uh, line here of the speckle pattern. If I see this speckle pattern, I would be hard pressed to say if this is interference due to many single scattering events or if there's multiple scattering involved. If I now do an average, I rotate this uh, sample and I look at the configuration average, I see this enhanced backscattering peak here, so there's more in light in the backward direction, and this tells me that this is interference based on multiple scattering. So a configuration average sometimes has more information than the single realization. So we did this with our cold atoms. Uh, and uh, uh, it works, so here we see this current backscattering peak uh, realized by cold atoms, so I come with a laser beam, I go in a cloud of cold atoms and look in the backward direction, and every pixel on the camera here gives me one uh, scattering angle. Uh, the small surprise for uh, newcomers to the field would be that this works also if I drive the atoms on resonance, but we know that even resonant uh, drive of uh, two-level systems can be coherent and we maintain the phase information. So that's just is, uh, another signature that uh, a coherent drive of two-level atoms can be coherent. And um, I also said that we have no exact theory, so at that time what we uh, used was the best model available on the market uh, in the uh, uh, late uh, 90s, and this is called the uh, diagrammatic approach, which is uh, uh, based on the uh, direct and reciprocal paths. And if you compare here the theory and the experimental data uh, without three parameter, it works very well. So there was no reason to think that this approximated uh, model would not be uh, perfect for, to go to under localization. Okay, so then uh, people tried to, do, to go into the strongly scattering regime using different samples, so they used uh, 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 semiconductor powders and white paint where they thought they could have this uh, yoffel regel criterion fulfilled and uh, there were to come some claims of uh, having observed under localization but the authors of all this work now agree that there was uh, uh, spurious effects which mimicked under localization but uh, absorption and uh, inelastic fluorescence here in this case here uh, uh, were really the explanation of the signatures they had. So uh, the state of the art is that no one has seen under localization of light so far in any disorder system. So it's still uh, an open question and it could be just a technical issue uh, or as we see maybe there's some more fundamental problems behind. 
So <coughs> what we have with cold atoms is that we can use ha Hamiltonians. We, so we can uh, simulate something. We have a Hamiltonian, we write fundamental equations, and run, then we try to understand what's behind. So that's our approach for cold atoms. So to come up with a, a scattering response of cold atoms, we take this uh, uh, two-level system, the qubits of uh, Dave, uh, but we have many of those two-level atoms, and uh, we look at uh, how uh, light is scattered. So we can uh, look at the amplitude of every dipole here, which is driven by the external laser here with the plane wave and the phase factor here. And then there's a free evolution here. There's a decay of every excited state here and some uh, free evolution de depending on the detuning. And then I have this more interesting part which uh, tells me how much this dipole here is excited by another dipole here. So there's a dipole M which radiates energy on dipole J and this is this uh, global coupling term which allows us to do mul multiple scattering. And once I know I can solve this equation here, once I know uh, that every dipole, I can compute every observable, like uh, the field scattered in any direction, so I get to whatever I can measure in the experiment. What is interesting in here is that this uh, coupling term here scales like 1 over R. So 1 over R is a long-range effect, and uh, this is uh, like a leading uh, red line in everything we do. This, this uh, is 1 over R. It's not 1 over R cube or 1 over R6. That's very important. Okay, so... From this, we can compute different things. For instance, if I come with a laser beam on a cloud of cold atoms. Uh, I look at the light in all directions. Uh, I look here, for instance, at the intensity as a function of angle. And uh, this blue line is what's coming out of this uh, model from the previous slide. So one thing I see is that, for instance, there's a very strong forward peak here. And this is uh, what you can expect from uh, an index of refraction. So you take this cloud of cold atoms, and you just say it's a, it's a, a bead uh, of a dielectric, and then you get the lens, and this is the lensing effect. You also get uh, scattering in every other direction here, which can also be described by the random walk model I uh, dis discussed previously. And then there's this mesoscopic weak localization peak here. So this model of the previous slide really includes all the uh, uh, mean field effect and the mesoscopic physics. So another thing we can do now is that we can take the same coupling term here, which has this one over R and sometimes some near field effects here. Uh, and look at eigenstates of the system. So now we go to a more fundamental level. We, we drop experiments and see what, what is the physics behind this. And uh, this Hamiltonian has the reminiscence of an Anderson model because the coupling term between different sides here is a random number because of the random position of the atoms. And, uh, 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 and it's an open system. Uh, light can escape, so it's a quantum open system. And we want to see what are the eigenstates of this system. So what one can show is that one compares uh, the, the, this Hamiltonian here take into account or not take into account the near field coupling, uh, one gets very uh, different behavior. Uh, one can use the scaling function as used by the Gang of Four in the 70s, and one can see that if you take into account the real nature of photons with the near field effect and the polarization, there's no under localization of light. So that's a big blow to the community, which means that if you take into account the detailed aspect of this wave, uh, the universal uh, character of localization disappears. So th that's uh, what is called our red light for under localization. So maybe under localization does not exist for, for light because of these near field terms, which are very important in this uh, issue. Uh, we can discuss this later, but that's a, a big game changer in this community. And it is, has been uh, possible because we went to this Hamiltonian fundamental understanding of what's happening in light scattering. Okay, so now uh, ex uh, going back to this long range dipole dipole interactions. Uh, so we come to this uh, type of Dicke type of physics. So the idea is, uh, Dicke said that there's another way of having photons interacting with many particles. And if you take uh, many, many particles, either all are in ground state or all in the excited state. And what Dicke showed is that if you start in this state here, there will be a cascade along the symmetric superposition of the, all these dipoles. And this will be much faster than independent atoms. That's what's called super radiance. And this has been observed in the 70s by Fell. So this is uh, well understood. Uh, what we are focused on now is uh, if you come on with a very weak laser type, a single photon, so we go only on the first excitation level here, then we see uh, in this single excitation level, so single photon excitation, we see a symmetric state here, which still is faster than independent atom decay, and then we have these other states here, which are longer lived than independent atom states. So that's uh, like a symmetric superposition here, and all the other anti-symmetric superpositions here, and these states here are subradiant, they are metastable states, and this is what we want to, to study. And uh, uh, Dicke did already this in his paper in the 50s, and what we did, we extended this to large volume, and the idea of the large, large volume is that it's no longer scaled with the number of atoms, but with an, a new cooperativity parameter, which is the uh, number of atoms divided by number of modes. So the idea is that if I have the wall here, and if the photon has to go outside the wall, uh, how many lambda squares can I put on the wall? That's how many doors there are to leave for a photon. If I have more atoms than doors, we, we have to discuss, we have to be synchronized. 
So uh, this cooperativity department is the number of atoms divided by the number of outgoing modes, and it turns out that this is also the optical thickness of a, cl a cloud of cold atoms. And this cooperativity department is also something which is important for random lasing, which is uh, something I, I, I would like to discuss uh, on another occasion. Okay, so we wanted to look for this thicker subradiance. So as I said, superradiance has been seen many places, that's easy. Subradiance has been seen actually uh, in the, uh, by Brewer uh, in, in the 90s when he was able to to uh, trap two ions at a uh, controlled distance, and depending on the distance of these two ions, the decay was either faster or slower than the independent at ion decay. So for two atoms, this was observed, and for two atoms, what is important is the distance between two atoms. And it's not the one of our long-range aspect which is important. For many, many atoms, uh, subradiance has not been observed, and uh, the, the reason is that you need a large cooperativity parameter in every direction, else you have escape lines, so you need large optical a thick cloud in all directions, and it exploits the long-range dipole-dipole interaction, so it's no longer the distance which uh, controls the, the feature, but the optical thickness. It's a global effect. It's long-range means it's a global effect. It's not a local effect. So we did some experiments by switching off a laser, and after the super-radiant fast decay, we saw this small, slow decay here with large cloud of cold atoms, so B0 is this cooperativity parameter, and uh, the, we, we see this universal scaling uh, where we have a lifetime of two orders of magnitudes larger than the independent atom lifetime uh, if you have a large cloud of cold atoms. And uh, so this scaling here shows that this is a thicker subradiant scaling, which is independent, different scaling from the incoherent random walk diffusion model or from Anders localization. Okay, so uh, with this I will come to the intensity correlation. So we, <coughs> we try to look a little bit more uh, at what happens in light scattering and our uh, idea based on the random lasing uh, issue actually was that can we do something in astrophysics? So uh, then we went back to uh, the historic uh, experiments by Henri Twist, who looked at uh, photon correlations, intensity correlation, and from this intensity correlation he could uh, uh, map the, uh, measure the angular diameter of stars, this well-known uh, experiments, and the quantum theory has been done by Glauber in the 60s, uh, so um, this works very well. Uh, the question is why did it uh, stop? Why did people stop this technique? And the answer is that uh, uh, when Henri Brantouet met Antoine Labéry, actually he did amplitude interferometry, and he could uh, uh, get much better uh, data much faster than the intensity correlation by Henri Van Twist. So that basically stopped all the effort in the end of the 60s on intensity correlations. Okay, and uh, uh, what Antoine Labéry did on this uh, uh, amplitude interferometer was it sent it to the VLTI or the Chara with baselines of 300 meters. So this works perfectly well. So it's an excellent technique. And the question is, why do we uh, want to uh, reinvent uh, the intensity correlation is to go to baselines larger than 300 meters. If you want to go to kilometers or more, uh, this technique is not really uh, possible in, in with the uh, techniques of today. So what we did is we did intensity correlation in cold atoms. That's easy, b basically, because the time scales is of the order of microseconds. Then we went to hot atoms. It's getting more difficult. Time scales get nanoseconds, so you need to have fast detectors. And then once this worked, we went to the uh, to the observatory close to our lab where they have a telescope. So uh, at the beginning of this year, we measured on the telescope on three different stars, photon bunching in the photon counting regime. So it's basically the same experiment Henry Brown Twist did, but we, now we, have, we can resolve a curve here and we're in the photon counting regime. And so this works. And uh, now actually this week, recently this week, we <coughs> uh, went back to the same and we did intensity collation on the two telescopes so that we have G2 of R, not only on one telescope. And uh, this also works, so for one star, we get, uh, uh, which are not resolved, we get a good bunching, and if you have a resolved star, we, the bunching reduces. So this technique now works, and we can, in principle, extend this to larger baselines, uh, which is uh, important for uh, astrophysical uh, imaging. The other aspect is that we can resolve G2 of tau, the time resolved, and then we can look, in principle, uh, if the light we get from, astro from, from, uh, from space is a classical thermal light or quantum light. A laser has different intensity correlation than thermal light. If there's some super radiance, amplified spontaneous emission, all this is possible. So maybe there's some random lasing in space, like Letokov uh, speculated on. And so we're going to try to look on uh, hydrogen lines to see if we can get any uh, non-classical features in quantum optics from space. Okay, with this, uh, I think I will scop skip the forces because that's uh, getting too long. And uh, I have to thank my collaborators here uh, Guillaume Labéry, which is actually the son of Antoine Labéry, this astrophysicist, uh, William Guérin and Mich Mathilde Fouché in the cold atom part, and uh, Farouk Fakli, Jean-Pierre Rivet, and David Vernet on the astrophysics component. And we have a large number of collaborations, of course, which help us to, uh, to understand everything we'd want to do in the experiment. And with this, I thank you for your attention.
plenty of time for discussion. Okay, questions? Oh, over there. So, um, thank you very much for the uh, no, nice talk. Um, uh, I think you are aware of the uh, double pick by Christian Miniatura and people. Double pick? Double, yes, yes, yes. Yes. Uh, would you like to elaborate something for the? Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, there's a, a prediction on an observable on the, when you have underslocalization localization of waves in the isotope medium, which is uh, a little bit like the current backscattering, but there's a symmetric peak in the forward direction. Uh, this is, has been studied for uh, localization if you're inside the sample and if you look at the momentum distribution. I don't know any uh, application of this, of uh, a, a signature where you're outside the sample. So for this, we would need to, <coughs> me, to probe the momentum distribution inside the sample, and um, this, I don't know how to do this with our current atoms, but uh, in, yeah, it's a problem to how to measure the momentum distribution inside, in situ. Any other question or comment? Okay, I don't see any more hands, so thanks once again.